Recently, Brother Hatcher asked me to give a sermon review of the 2008 lectureship, the book in particular, which is entitled Preaching from the Major Prophets. And it's only 438 pages, covering 30 speakers. So you can see it's a small assignment, but we'll do the best we can in the time that we have allotted. In fact, it might take a little bit more than the time allotted. As we look at this particular book and lectureship, if you had the opportunity to be here and did not take advantage of it, it was your loss, because it was a good lectureship and the material that was presented was well prepared and the speakers did their part. The Bible includes five major prophetical books, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And yet the lectureship book is arranged in four basic sections because Jeremiah wrote two of those books. And so the lectureship book only has the four uh, speakers involved with it. Now as Paul somewhat insinuated, if I gave only four minutes to each lesson, we'd be here for two hours. I don't think you want to be here that long, so we better get moving into the lesson. The book is in, arranged in the following logical order. First, a general, general introduction is given to the major prophet books by Gary Summers, in which he briefly described the background of each of the prophets, and then he cited some spiritual gems, as he referred to them, relating to each one. Now, the rest of the lecture book is divided into, uh, by profit into four groups, each of these having several lessons involved. Each profit uh, group, for example, has one lesson which is entitled The Man and then identifies the man by name. These are followed then by several lessons for each of the major groups and discuss significant passages within those groups. My comments this evening on these obviously have to be very brief in regard to cover each of these prophetic groups due to the time limitations. So the first of these groups that we're going to talk about is the group that involve the prophet Isaiah. The first lesson involved with this group is called The Man, Isaiah, and Gene Hill was the speaker for this. He told us that Isaiah was the son of Amos. He had a wife and two sons. He preached against several different sins of Judah. And these sins involve greed, for one thing, drunkenness, defiance against Jehovah, lacks moral awareness, self-conceit, and drunkenness and injustice among the elite. Most of the people that Isaiah preached to would not listen to him, but God assured Isaiah that he would spare a remnant. The second lesson that we had within the lectureship book is one taught by Brother Davidson. It's called A View Toward Pentecost, Isaiah 2, verses 2 through 5. Brother Davidson began his lesson with some definitions. And in these definitions, the first one he dealt with, he said a major prophet, or a prophet is called a major prophet because he wrote more than the minor prophets did. He moved from that to define biblical prophets as being spokesmen for God. They spoke about the past, the present, and the future. Not just the future, as what some people generally think prophets speak about. Brother Davidson spoke about chapter 2 of the book of Acts as being the hub of the Bible. And when you think of a hub, that's what's in the center. And so you've got the Old Testament prophecies pointing forward toward that hub. You've got the uh, statements regarding the church following that hub and pointing back to it. And you can identify then where the church or kingdom began. He showed the importance of the day of Pentecost in the lesson that he presented. 
He showed that Isaiah 2, verses 2 through 3, deals with four different things. These four things involve the last days, the house of the Lord, all nations shall flow unto it, and lastly, the word of the Lord shall go forth from Jerusalem. We move to the third of the lessons in the section entitled Isaiah. This one has been entitled The Virgin Birth, Isaiah 7.14, and was presented to us by Daniel Denham. Brother Denham wrote about the importance of the virgin birth. He emphasized that the virgin birth related to the conception of Jesus Christ, not the delivery of the baby itself. Jesus was conceived in Mary by God through the Holy Spirit. Brother Denham showed how Isaiah 7:14 was a sign, and that sign was only fulfilled in Matthew 1 and verse 23 through the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. It was not a dual prophecy, partially fulfilled in the days of King Ahaz and later in the New Testament. That, of course, is what some people teach. It would not be a sign, for example, for a young woman to conceive a male child, but it would be a sign for a virgin to conceive without having known man. That would be a miracle. The virgin birth assures us that the name Emmanuel, which means God with us, as used in Matthew 1 and verse 23, is fulfilled only through Christ, who truly is God with us. Moving to the next lesson, this one's entitled Strength from the Lord, Isaiah 40, and was presented to us by Sherman Offord. Brother Alford began by stating that the only true source of strength comes from God. He then outlines his chapter in this way. First of all, a charge to comfort or strengthen God's people. And this was taken from the 40th chapter, verses 1 and 2. Then, he says, Zion, or Jerusalem, was to announce the coming of the Lord God. And this he points us to verses 9 through 11 of that assigned text. Thirdly, God is beyond human measure and counsel. And we see this directed to verses 12 through 14. Before God, the nations are nothing. Verses 14, or 15 rather, through 17. Men compare God to their constructions. These thoughts are directed to verses 18 through 20. God is too great for no likeness can be equal to him. And this he directed us to verses 21 through 26. Lastly, a lack of trust in God rebuked. He provides strength to the weary. And this he drew from verses 27 through 31. The next lesson we have is one that is entitled The Suffering Servant, Isaiah 53. And this was presented by Brother Danny Douglas. Brother Douglas began his lesson by stating that only Jesus can fulfill the prophecy of the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. He presented an outline of the chapter as follows. The early years and rejection of Jesus, verses 1 through 3. A willing substitute for the guilty, verses 4 through 6. The innocent and submissive Savior, verses 7 through 9. The resurrection and future glory of the servant of Jehovah, verses 10 through 12. Included in this lesson is a discussion of the conversion of of the Ethiopian eunuch by Philip, as recorded in Acts chapter 8, verses 32 and 33. You remember how the eunuch was studying from Isaiah 53, and from it, Peter preached Jesus to him. We move now to the next lesson, entitled, The Good News of Salvation, Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3. 
This was presented by Brother Loy Hardesty. Brother Hardesty outlined his lesson in the form of an expository sermon by separating each of these verses in the assigned verses 1 through 3 of chapter 61 into its component parts. Then he makes the application of each part to the area of our lives, showing our responsibilities and blessings as we live our Christian lives. His outline, then, is as follows. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Next, the Lord hath appointed me, or anointed me, rather, to preach good things, to bind up the, the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the joy or the oil of joy for mourning. That's M O U R N I N G. The garment of praise, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. The next lesson is presented by none other than our brother Michael Hatcher. It's entitled, The New Name, Isaiah 62 and verse 2. Brother Hatcher began by pointing out that the new name of Isaiah 62, verse 2, needs to meet or must meet certain criteria. First, it must be given in the New Testament, or it would be given in the New Testament times, after the conversion of Cornelius after the Gentiles had seen God's righteousness. Next, it would be given after the glory of Christ's church would be seen by kings, or in another way of expressing the kings, those in political positions of power. He further stated reasons why suggested names do not meet the criteria of that new name. The name Christian does meet the criteria of Isaiah 62.2 in that the meaning of the word means Christ-like. It was first used after the conversion of Cornelius and after the glory of the church was recognized by those in authority. Next, he stated that the name Christ in English means anointed one. The anointed ones in Bible times were priests, prophets, and kings. Jesus is our high priest he likewise was a prophet and currently serves as king of kings. He also showed that Christians are Christ-like in that the scriptures show that Christians are a royal priesthood. They are prophets as they speak forth the word of God. And they are kings in this life, according to Romans 5 verse 17 and Revelation 5 verse 10, as they rule over sin tribulation, persecution, and so forth. We move to the next major section of our lesson. This is entitled, uh, as far as Jeremiah and Lamentations. The first lesson being the man, Jeremiah, and was given to us by Brother Tim Kozad. Brother Kozad stated that Jeremiah was born about 647 B.C. at Anathoth, near Jerusalem. His father was Hilkiah, a priest. He preached during the reigns of King Josiah, Jehoahaz, and Jehoiachin. God did not permit him to marry and have a family. Because of the difference between his personal nature and the strict message that God gave him to preach, Jeremiah was a sad and lonely person. In fact, at one time, he decided to quit preaching. But he said he could not do so, because God's word was like a burning fire in his bones, and that he had to keep preaching. Jeremiah's instructions from God were to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. Brother Kozad quoted Jeremiah 12, verse 5. If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with horses? 
And if in the land of peace, where there, wherein thou trusted, they wearied thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? And he then applied the verse to Christians today. As we look at Brother Kozad's application of this lesson now, he first directs us to running with horses of apathy. You remember we heard a lesson somewhere back along the way about apathy, or maybe more than one. Secondly, running with horses serving two masters. Third, running with horses of compromising brethren. Fourth, running with horses of persecution. He closed with Jeremiah 8, verse 20, which says, The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. We need that kind of resolve that Jeremiah had in his day. The next lesson is God's commission to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 1, verses 4 through 10, by Brother Dub McClish. Brother McClish began his assigned lesson by referring to Moses' warning to Israel centuries before that God would punish Israel if they did not hearken to the voice of Jehovah. And then he related how Israel had done the very thing that God, through Moses, had warned them against. He then outlined the major points in his assigned text in this way. First, God appointed Jeremiah, verses 4 through 5. Secondly, Jeremiah responds to God, verse 6. God answers Jeremiah, verses 7 and 8. God equips Jeremiah, verse 9. God enables Jeremiah, verse 10. And then he applied these major points cited in his outline to some of the problems in our time, such as abortion, to pride, fellowship, liberalism, and false doctrine. He then closed with a charge to all Christians that we must serve God faithfully and trust him to deliver us from evil men. Next lesson is entitled, Broken Cisterns, Jeremiah 2, verse 13, and was presented to us by Brother Tim Smith. Brother Smith began by quoting his text and then defining the terms in this text as follows. First, the fountain of living waters is God and true religion. Secondly, the broken cisterns are false religions of men. He then discussed true religion by quoting several scriptures that show that God desires men or man to be what man should be and what he should do. He then discussed false religion as it's manifested in several terms. These include ceremonialism, false professions, sanctimony, pharisaic separation, assumed innocence, religious display, formalism, and hypocrisy. He then showed how false religion, at its very best, is of but little comfort in this world and of no use at all in the next world. Examples of false religion are uncharitableness, religious talk, harsh judgment, preaching and not practicing, false professions, selfishness, and inconsistency. Next lesson is presented by Brother David Brown. It was entitled, Peace, Where There Is No Peace. And Brother Brown began his lesson with a definition of spiritual peace. He stated that this peace is only found in Christ, where all spiritual blessings are found, Ephesians 1, verse 3. To get into Christ, one must be obedient to the gospel plan of salvation. To be at peace with God, we must preach and defend the whole counsel of God. God's plan is for scripturally qualified elders to see that faithful preachers preach the sermons and godly teachers teach the Bible lessons. He illustrated improper preaching with cotton candy. That may be a little unusual if you think about it in that relationship. 
But he said you get very little value from it. Have you ever taken a bite of cotton candy thinking you're going to get something out of that big mass and then it, it just melts down in your mouth and you have almost nothing? Improper preaching lacks real Bible teaching. True gospel preaching is a combination of reproving, rebuking, and exhorting the brethren as a whole. As the whole counsel of God is preached to Christian and alien sinner alike. He cited problems with false teachers in both the past and present and gave examples of each one. True peace cannot exist where these doctrinal errors are not corrected. Jesus Christ is the Christian's peace because our Lord on Calvary's cross paid our debt to God with his sinless body that he offered on the cross in sacrifice for our sins and with his blood that he lovingly shed for the remission of our sins. Next we come to the lesson entitled Inability to Blush. Jeremiah 6 verse 15 presented by Brother De Dennis Skip Francis. Brother Francis began his lesson by illustrating how TV, movies, and so forth have calloused our minds to abomination. Then he goes to a passage dealing with abomination in Jeremiah 6 verse 15, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? And then he quoted Proverbs 6 verses 16 through 19, which lists seven different things that are an abomination to the Lord. And we'll list those things, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devices wicked imaginations, swift feet running to mischief, a false witness, and sowing discord. He then showed how each of these things can be related to our society today. When we allow ourselves to be influenced daily by those things that are an abomination to God, we lose the ability to blush. The Lord's Church has been seriously affected by these sins. We need to return to the teachings and practices that will enable us as Christians to have the ability to blush. Next is the lesson entitled, Ask for the Old Paths, Jeremiah 6, verse 16, by David Hartbarger. Brother well, Hartbarger introduced his subject by comparing the Lord's Church today to the days of Jeremiah. Many have left the old paths and are following the broad way. The old paths require a thus saith the Lord, not a my will be done attitude. He cited how Jeremiah was calling on the people to see, to look at what they were doing. In doing so, he reviewed some of, the, some of Judah's history from King Josiah to the days of King Jehoiakim. It's evident that the people were following after their own lusts, not the old paths which God had directed them to go. When Jeremiah told them to ask for the old paths, they refused. But it was not Jeremiah that the people rejected. It was really a rejection of God. In his concluding remarks, Brother Hartbarger called attention to a recent article in Contending for the Faith, which related to a young lady from which fellowship had been withdrawn by the Southwest Church of Christ in Austin, Texas. He cited how this lady could see nothing wrong with what she was doing. And then he drew a parallel to what the people in Jeremiah's day were doing in their rejection of God. We move next to a lesson entitled Perpetual Backsliding. This was presented by Brother Lester Camp. Brother Camp began his lesson by calling attention to the constant backsliding of Israel from the days of Egyptian bondage to the times of the kings in the days of Samuel. He then reminded us of how backsliding was evident in the days of the New Testament, in Jesus' disciples and in the early church. He then set forth the causes of perpetual backsliding. And these are the ways he listed them. Perverted belief, the people do not want to hear the truth, indifference to sin, selfishness, ignorance, 
vain self-confidence. He concluded with an admonition to continue preaching the word of God and to call men to repentance without fear or favor. We move next to a lesson entitled Jeremiah's Gethsemane. Jeremiah 20, verse 9, presented by Brother Darrell Broking. Brother Broking made a detailed analysis of Jeremiah's life and emphasized his strong points, his weak points, and his eventual decision to do God's will in God's way. Like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jeremiah resolved himself to accomplish the Lord's will regardless of the consequences. A portion of Brother Broking's concluding remarks well summarizes his lesson as follows. And I quote from his writing. Jeremiah was a great prophet of God. He made his share of mistakes, but as he matured in his relationship with God, he developed an attitude that's exemplary for all of God's people. Most people do not enter into a relationship with God thinking about all the trials and tribulations that they will have to face if they stand faithful to God's cause. Jeremiah obviously underestimated the severity of his fate and his ability to perform his work. For a time, he did what many do under similar circumstances. That is, he compromised and gravitated toward the people. One of the wonderful qualities of Jeremiah, however, was his willingness to repent and seek the healing that only God can supply. He repented and stood up for God with unwavering zeal and steadfastness. Therein lies the lessons for members of the Lord's Church. Christians are people who have made a total commitment to God and who walk with Him. As Jeremiah 20, verse 9, is Jeremiah's Garden of Gethsemane, Romans 12, 1, is to be the Christian's Garden of Gethsemane. We move next to a lesson that was entitled The New Covenant, Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. This was presented to us by Brother Paul Vaughn. Brother Vaughn began his lesson by saying that the sound interpretation of the Scripture is essential to understanding the different covenants that God has established with man throughout history. He then defined the term, term covenant and showed that God will keep all the terms of his covenant as long as man is obedient to the terms in that pledge. He stated that Jeremiah's prophecy in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34, and as repeated in the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, verse 7 through 13, was a new covenant to replace the covenant that God had given his people through Moses. The law of Moses was a schoolmaster or tutor to train the Jews about the coming of the seed of Abraham. The new covenant was not written on tables of stone, but in the hearts of man. It was for all mankind, not just the Jews. Under Moses' law, the old covenant, the people of God had to be taught about God after they were born physically. Under Christ's law, the new covenant, the people of God must learn of God before they are born spiritually. Under the new covenant, forgiveness of sins is possible because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Because of the new covenant, the old covenant has become obsolete and vanished away. Hebrews 8 and verse 13. We move next to a lesson entitled Jehoiakim's Penknife, Jeremiah 36, presented by Brother Dub Mowry. Brother Mowry first described how scrolls were written in Jeremiah's day. They were written on either parchment or vellum, which was made from animal skins. The writing instrument in Jeremiah's day was a slender reed, and a penknife was used to sharpen the point. Then he related the incident in Jeremiah 36 when God's word given to Jeremiah were read to King Jehoiakim, who promptly cut up the scroll and with his penknife and burned the scroll in the fire. 
Brother Mallory related several instances of how God had passed his word down to man through the centuries. He also related numerous instances of how man has attempted to destroy the inspired word of God. Regardless of man's efforts to destroy the word of God, they have failed. The human race will be judged by Christ's inspired word on the day of judgment. We move next to Ezekiel. And the first lesson in the section of Ezekiel is called The Man, Ezekiel, presented by Brother David Watson. <clears throat> Brother Watson began his lesson with a summary of biblical history from the period before the flood to the period of the church. He followed this with a chronology of Ezekiel's life. Next, he cites that Ezekiel was born in the 18th year of King Josiah and lived in the area of Jerusalem from 622 B.C. to 597 B.C. when he was taken captive in the second deportation of prisoners to Babylon. Ezekiel was married, but when his wife died with a stroke, God told him not to mourn as a sign to the people. Ezekiel lived during very turbulent times of Judah, but the people knew that a prophet had been among them. And that same thought, a prophet had been, been among them, is coming up in the next section then, which is entitled, Will They Know There Is a Prophet? Ezekiel 2, verse 5, presented by John West. Brother West began his lesson by presenting a historical background similar to some of the other speakers. He then presented some personal information about the prophet Ezekiel. He discussed the responsibility of a preacher today. He lists the preacher must speak the truth or preach the truth and expose error. The preacher must preach the truth regardless of what others do or who is affected by it. He noted how many preachers today fail to be watchmen. They fail to preach the whole truth. They fellowship those who teach false doctrine. He concluded his lesson by reminding us that preaching is a serious endeavor. When the sermon is finished, the congregation should know that there has been a faithful preacher among them. We move next to a lesson entitled, The Glory of the Lord in Shebar, Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 23, preached to us by Brother Jeff Litke. Brother Litke introduced his lesson by referring to the captives of Judah as they were taken to Babylon and settled by the river Chebar. He then considered the glorious vision of the living creatures that God gave to Ezekiel as recorded in chapter 1 of Ezekiel. And these creatures were later identified as cherubim. If you recall the note in Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 20. He also described how the cherubim were present in the Garden of Eden, in the tabernacle, and in the temple. The glory of God was also present as a part of the vision at the river Chebar. He called attention to the fact that the glory of God involves his holiness and his judgments. He noted that often man has mistaken the true glory of God by looking for God's glory in material things, such as the temple, maybe their jobs, emphasizing numbers, and in their riches. Today, man often fails to recognize God's glory when they consider the simplicity of the church, the gospel, the sacrifice of Christ upon the cross, and the opportunity that God has given us to overcome sin in our lives. Next lesson is entitled, The False Prophets, Ezekiel 13, by Brother Lynn Parker. Brother Parker introduced his lesson by stating that by looking at the characteristics of false prophets as addressed in Ezekiel 13, we find a parallel with the false teacher of our day. In the body of his lesson, he noted how false prophets are selfish, negligent, bring false hope, will lie, and that God opposes them. As illustrations of the above, he referred to a lesson presented by Brother Bill Jackson in which Brother Jackson condemned those who only preach the positive and fail to speak out as they should. 
He also related to a sermon by Brother Robert Taylor, in which Brother Taylor taught that one cannot be considered faithful when he ignores the teachings of 2 John 9 through 11. He then noted that Brother Taylor does not practice what he preached. He closed his lesson with Jesus' statement in Matthew 5, verses 10 through 12, which reads as follows, Blessed are they that have been persecuted for righteousness, for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Moving now to a lesson entitled God's Watchman, Ezekiel chapter 33 by Brother Bruce Stolting. As Brother Stolting introduced his lesson, he reminded us that Judah had been listening to the false prophets for years. It would, it would not be easy for Ezekiel to get them to repent. The major points of his lesson were first Ezekiel the watchman, which included these items. Ezekiel's call. He was to speak only the words that God had given him. His instructions. He was to speak to the house of Israel. He was not to be discouraged by their hard hearts. Next, his grave responsibility. He was compared to a watchman upon whose warnings the lives of people depended. It was a matter of life and death. His message he is to warn the people of God that God will people that God will destroy them if they fail to repent. And lastly then, the people's objection and the Lord's response. They said that God was not fair. His way was not equal. However, God responded that it was not the it was the people whose way was not equal. God was merely keeping his promise to Abraham. He then asked the question, are there modern day watchmen? And we note that the Old Testament prophets were often referred to as watchmen. Apostles and prophets of Christ were watchmen. Evangelists are watchmen. Elders are watchmen. Every Christian must be a watchman for his soul and the souls of others. We now move to a lesson called Turn and Live, Ezekiel 33, verse 10, by Brother Lee Moses. Brother Moses introduced his lesson by showing the attitude of the Israelites who were thinking that if their sins remained upon them, then they had no hope. However, Ezekiel showed that God is not forcing them to remain in that condition. He showed that God punished Israel because of their sins. God promised Judah for the same reason, or punished Judah, rather, for the same reason. But God wants the wicked to repent and to be saved. Ezekiel showed that no one can save himself by himself. They needed to take advantage of God's grace, but it would require Israel to, to turn from their sins. God did not want Israel to despair in their past sins. They needed to realize that God was offering them deliverance from their sins if they would turn and live. However, it must be on God's terms, not theirs. We move next to the major section of Daniel. The first lesson is called The Man Daniel by Jess Whitlock. Brother Whitlock introduced his lesson by noting that Daniel was still a young man when he was taken into Babylonian captivity. He lived during the times of Ezekiel and Jeremiah. He used an acrostic. An acrostic is a matter of using the letters in a word to take each letter and have it relate to something in particular, a lesson to be presented. He used an acrostic to present the man, Daniel. The D equals dedicated. Daniel did not defile himself with the things from the king's table. The letter A is equal to acquaintances. He chose good friends named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who helped him to remain faithful. The letter N is equal to never give in. Daniel and his friends would not give in to sin against God regardless of the consequences. The letter I is equal to interpreter. And you remember how Daniel interpreted King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The letter E is equal to example. And Daniel was an example of faithfulness to God. 
And lastly, the letter L relates to a lion tamer. And you remember about Daniel in the lion's den. We move next to a lesson entitled Nonconformity, Daniel 1 by Brother Brad Green. Brother Green introduced his lesson by showing that Daniel was an example of nonconformity to the majority as shown in chapter 1. He discussed how Daniel was a very wise individual, well-educated, and blessed with understanding. It was necessary for Daniel to be a nonconformist when he knew that the truth was in conflict with the king's commands. Daniel was resolved to obey God regardless of the consequences. He and his three friends knew that God had the power to save them if it was his will to do so. God's divine favor was given to Daniel and his friends because they served him faithfully. Nonconformity to error can be very beneficial to us today in more than one way. For example, first, we have nothing to be ashamed of. Secondly, we can receive the respect of others. And third, nonconformity results in respect from God. Brother Green stated that we must be nonconformist with respect to the way that we dress, with respect to alcohol, with respect to gambling, with respect to language, and with respect to dancing. Move, moving next to the uh, lesson entitled Nebuchadnezzar's Dream, Daniel chapter 2 and chapter 7, presented by Ken Chumbly. Brother Chumbly introduced his lesson by stating that King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, as we see in chapter 2, and Daniel's dream of chapter 7 relate to the same prophetical events. He first discussed Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter 2 of a huge image and its interpretation. And you remember the image was broken down into several parts. First, the head of gold was equivalent to the Babylonian kingdom. The breast and arms of silver were equal to the Medo-Persian kingdom. The belly and thighs of brass were equal to the Greek kingdom. And the legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay, equaled the Roman kingdom. <coughs> A stone cut out without hands, which smote the legs and feet of the image and broke into pieces the whole image, was equal to the church or the kingdom of God. He then showed that the views of premillennialism cannot be true. He then discussed Daniel's dream in chapter 7 of four beasts and its interpretation. He stated that the four beasts of chapter 7 are equivalent to the four parts of the image in chapter 2. He shows that the views of the premillennialist doctrine <coughs> cannot be true. He noted that the Bible scholars disagree as, the correct, as to the correct view of Daniel 7. And then he presented the view of Rex Turner, which he appeared to favor. We move next to a section that was entitled, If But Will, Daniel 3 by Rolf Ruffner. Rather unusual title, to say the least. Brother Ruffner introduced his lesson with a brief description of the problems of Daniel's three friends who were faced with the decision of whether they would worship Nebuchadnezzar's golden image or not. <clears throat> First, consider what Daniel was faced with here. A setting that was inviting to commit sin. Nebuchadnezzar had built a golden image about 90 feet high. He had commanded all the government officials to be present for the declaration or dedication of this idol. The penalty for failure to worship the idol, as commanded when the music played, was for the guilty individual to be cast into the fiery furnace. Notice also that the pressure to sin was imposing. Everybody's doing it. We ever hear that? Today we likewise face decisions to sin or not, but we must be faithful to God. Then we come to 
the writer's consideration of the title, If But Will. The response to the king is seen in the title of this lesson. And he turns our attention to Daniel 3, verses 17 and 18, <clears throat> which reads as follows. If it be so, our Lord whom we serve is able to deliver us from the fire furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And you see my emphasis in, all, in those words from which the title was derived. They were rewarded for their faithfulness to God. Even though they were cast into the furnace, the king promoted the three men and issued a decree of death to anyone who would defile the God of these three men. We move next to a lesson called God Rules. Brother Grant stated in his introduction to Daniel 4 and should remind each child of God of God's ultimate power over all forms of government. He outlined his lesson in the following way. First, he introduced the subject. Then he notes the history behind Nebuchadnezzar's rise to power, the haughty spirit of Nebuchadnezzar, the humility of Nebuchadnezzar, the higher powers and Nebuchadnezzar, the higher powers and Jehovah, the higher powers and the Christian. And then he concludes his lesson. In this lesson, we see a powerful and a haughty king who was brought from his throne to what I consider the cow pasture. After being forced to live as an outcast who suffered from mental madness for seven times, God's mercy allowed Nebuchadnezzar's sense of reason to return to him. And his praise of God following this, then, is one of the greatest declarations in all Scripture. Daniel 4, verses 34 through 37. We next go to a lesson presented by Brother Wayne Blake entitled, The Writing on the Wall, Daniel 5. <clears throat> Brother Blake introduced his lesson with a very brief outline of chapters 1 through 4 of Daniel. He then outlined chapter 5 of Daniel as follows. First, alcohol and idolatry in the king's court, verses 1 through 4. The writing on the wall, verses 5 through 9. The arrival of God's man, verses 10 through 16. The indictment against the king, verses 17 through 24. The sentence and execution, verses 25 through 31. He then applied his outline as follows. Alcohol will cause one to make wrong decisions. And then he notes some other things that are problems. Idolatry, pride, the things of God cannot be used as common. He considers the subject of fellowship, the home, the words that people use today. And in conclusion then, he notes that Daniel was written hundreds of years ago, and yet the lessons from this book are so needed today. In my conclusion then, as far as the lesson tonight is concerned, this has been a very good lectureship this year. If you don't have the book which I have here beside me, you're missing something. It would be a very valuable addition to your personal library. As we extend the invitation of Christ tonight, in conclusion, we want to extend the invitation to each of you. Jesus said if you believe in him and are baptized, you can be saved. Mark 16:16. 16, 16. He further stated that we must repent of our sins to have a part in the kingdom of God. Luke 13, verses 3, and repeated in verse 5. He said we must be willing to confess him as the Son of God, in order for him to confess us before God. Matthew 10, verse 32. He also said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16, 16. If as a Christian you haven't been faithful to God, faithful to Christ, you need to repent 
and ask God to forgive you. Acts 8, verse 22. If you're subject to the invitation of Christ, won't you come as we stand and sing?